We um, are starting something new today. For the next couple of weeks, we want to talk about uh, a series that we're calling Money Talks. Uh, I was joking with our dream team, with our volunteer servant leaders before service, and I was saying one of the first rules about church promotion is when you're going to talk about money, you don't tell them in advance. Uh, because people are like, oh my goodness, you know. And I, I, had this, I, I had this thing that's been happening lately. Our, our uh, three-year-old, Ava, has been, you know, getting up out of bed early in the morning. Sometimes we, we're trying to every, every possible way that we can get her to stay in bed uh, as long as possible. But she will, get, um, she will get out of bed and you won't hear her at all. She comes silently from her room down the hallway and then she'll stand in the doorway of our room and her hair is really long, and it's just standing in front of her face, and she stares at it. It's like the girl from The Ring, for those of you who know what I'm talking about. It's like this terrifying thing. And then she'll, she'll just stare at you like this while you sleep, which is creepy anyway. And then eventually, if you open your eyes, she'll say, games. I want games, <laughs> which is what she calls it when we give her, like, an iPhone or something like that. She could play some games on that. And so, like, her thing in the morning, if we, if we need extra time or whatever like that to sleep, you can judge us if you want. Uh, but we'll be like, here. So she just looks at the games. And uh, I had this feeling of, like, th this Money Talks series is, like, one of those moments where people are, like, have that same fear. You know, like, oh, he's going to talk about money. He's going to talk about it. But the bottom line is when we look at the Bible... And when we look in particular at what Jesus talked about, he talked about money quite a bit. As a matter of fact, uh, depending on the way you look at the numbers of parables that he told, uh, more than half of them involved money and, and probably about a third of them actually talked specifically about how we deal with money in our lives. And so more than evangelism or heaven or hell or any other single topic, almost some of those topics combined, Jesus addressed this because it's such a significant issue in our lives. Now, it's good news for you to know that Jesus only asked for money once, right? And, and from all that we can tell, it was just for the sake of an illustration, right? And then he, uh, you, know, you know, we can infer that he, he uh, gave the, the money back after he was done with the illustration. So let me assure you today, at the conclusion of our service, I am not going to be taking another offering. I won't be uh, asking for anything from you other than to talk about this because it's such a big issue in our lives that we need to pay attention to what God has to say about it. It's an area where I think a lot of people falter and actually don't experience the freedom and the peace that God would have for them to experience. And so we want to talk about that today. All of God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. So the point here is God's word can keep us from stumbling and it can keep us from stumbling in this area too. And so for these two weeks, I want to talk, first of all, about the foundation of this, about how we treat money and how we view money. And next week, I want to talk about a framework for how you and I can live in obedience to what the Lord has to say about this. So I'm going to ask you to do this because it hasn't been a great service so far. I really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed Some of you guys saw me in the hallway. You're like, what's wrong? Why hasn't service? I'm like, there's somebody else on stage leading worship, and, and we're just hanging out. Can we give it up for the worship team and say thank you for leading us in worship? Seth, Brianna, Charlotte, the rest of the team did an amazing job. And then I'm going to invite you to stand with me because I want to read you our text today. From Matthew chapter 6, the title of what I'm sharing is Who's Telling Who? Money talks, but who's telling who? So Matthew 6, Jesus says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Lord, add your blessing and your anointing to the reading of your word today, and let every heart be open to what you have to say, that we might be obedient to you and leave this place, Lord, bearing fruit for your sake and for the sake of the world you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. God bless you today. 
Many of you have heard this or read this text before, and so we bring our own ideas to it and maybe our own, um, our, our own pre-established uh, understanding of it. I want to talk about it today and hopefully shine a little bit of light on this text and help us to know how do we move forward in understanding uh, particularly what Jesus is teaching us in this particular portion of the Scripture. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. He says you, you can't serve both God, and then for most of us, if we were to insert something else there, we might say the devil, right? Or we can't serve both God and, you know, you name it, selfishness or something else like that. Very few of us, if we had never heard this text before, would insert the word money into that particular sentence. But isn't it interesting that when Jesus is talking about the chief competitor to our service to God and to our devotion to God, that he actually says it's money that's the chief competition. Isn't that interesting? Everybody runs the risk of making money their ultimate pursuit or their ultimate concern. And isn't it fascinating to you, it is to me, that though sometimes we view ourselves in this era as as enlightened and elevated, and we look at ancient people as, oh my goodness, how did they even, how did that even work? It's, it's, just, it's just luck that we're all still here today because they were so, isn't it interesting that in Jesus' day, 2,000 years ago, that his words were just as relevant then as they are today? It really says something about our nature that this is applicable today and that when Jesus says you can't serve two masters, that you'll, you, can, you, can, you either have to serve God or money, that that, that, he, that that idea of money being the chief competitor to our heart and to our loyalty is still probably very accurate to this day. So I want to talk here. Our series is called Money Talks, but I'm going to give you a few key points today, and I would really love it if you took some notes because I actually feel like this is one of these things. I, I, know, I know how people really need to process through this, and it's one of these moments where if you write this stuff down and you go back later and you process and pray about this, God might actually help continue to show things to you that you need to understand. I am not your boss. I'm not the boss of you. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Literally, I'm offering these thoughts to you today in the hopes that they might provide a pathway to you for greater blessing and freedom in your life. So let me just write this down. Number one here for you is just a simple statement, and we're going to come back to it both weeks. Money always talks. Money always talks. It's just sometimes we're not great at listening to what it's telling us. Our money will talk to us if we listen to it, right? Jesus tells us it's going to speak to you, and I'll explain that in just a second. But here's a great, a great uh, long ago I found this letter uh, or this illustration, and, and it was a great letter from a student who was away at school. By the way, welcome to some of our college students who are home from school. Let's give it up for them. It's great to have them back home. But he was away at school, and he, you know, sent this note to his dad, and, and, and just to update him on stuff. He says, Dear Dad, school is really great. I'm making lots of friends and studying very hard. With all my stuff, I just can't think of anything I need. So if you, if you would like, you can just send me a card, as I would love to hear from you. Love, your son. So you can kind of read there between the lines, right, and see uh, that, that there was something being asked for a little bit. Did you get the message? Anybody here get the message? Okay, so his dad sent him back a response, said, Dear son, I know that astronomy, economics, and oceanography are enough to keep even an honor student busy. Do not forget that the pursuit of knowledge is a noble task, and you can never study enough. Love, dad. How many dads can relate to that? Amen? Jesus says, if you listen... Your heart is going to tell you something. If you want to know what you value and what is important to you and what you love in your life, he says, just find your heart. Because wherever you find your money at, that's where you're going to find. I'm sorry, just find out where your money is because that's where you'll find where your heart is. Money always talks. It will clarify where your heart is or what is in your heart. It's like a map to the things that we value. And I, I hate to say it so plainly and so clearly because most of us want to complicate things more, but we invest in what we love, right? We put our resources toward what matters to us. 
And so if we want to pay attention to that, you will find if you just look, I know as crazy as it sounds, if you just look at a bank statement or a credit card statement, you will actually see the things that you are spending your money on and you'll actually see the things that you are quite literally investing in because you find them to be valuable. And it could be kids' activities or it could be, uh, you know, stuff for, it could be school. If you're paying for a school bill, that's a valuable thing to invest in. It could, whatever it is, we can look at what we're spending our resources on and we can, Jesus says, determine from that what matters most to us. So money always talks. It will clarify what's in our hearts. But money always talks. It will amplify what is in your heart. This is where it's very interesting to me. Jesus is talking about money, and then he all of a sudden pivots and says, the eye is the lamp of the body. And you say, you know what? What, what is, why does he go straight from, you know, talking about money to saying the eye is the lamp of the body and, you know, if the eye is good, then, then, then your whole body will be full of light if it's bad. And I want you to understand from the ancient perspective, the way that they would look at this is the eye was like a window to the body. And so if my eye was good, then there would be light in me. And if my eye was bad, then it didn't matter if there was light all around me, there would be darkness in me, right? And he is putting money and our view of money in this idea, into this place of our eyes. How we see with our eyes in relationship to money, Jesus says, has a great impact on the rest of our lives. He says, not only is it going to have an impact, but he says it's going to amplify. Because he says, if your eye is good, your whole body is going to be full of light. But if your eye is dark, he says, how great is that darkness? It's going to amplify whatever there is going on in our hearts. It doesn't matter if we're in broad daylight. If our eyes are bad, what Jesus is saying is there's still darkness. The the, the light doesn't make it into, into our hearts. Now, it's It's interesting because in Jesus' day, just like ours, he's saying it's possible for people to be blinded by materialism, to be blinded by riches or wealth. Now, he never discounts. As a matter of fact, there were plenty of wealthy people who followed Jesus and who were instrumental in helping even, you remember, even even when Jesus died, it was a wealthy man who had his own grave already purchased and, and set aside who actually provided, who lent it to Jesus. Now, I don't think he knew he was going to lend it to him, <laughs> right? But in, he's the only guy in history who ever needed to borrow a grave for a few days, right? So that's what happened. There were plenty of wealthy people who, who were uh, in the circle that Jesus called friends, but he also made plenty of comments where he said, it's very difficult. <laughs> It's very difficult for wealthy people because that money, that materialism, that wealth can sometimes become a blinder on them. $20 is not too much. And you know what? I I forgot my $20 bill this morning. But $20 is not too much. um, But if you put it in the wrong place, it can really keep you from seeing. (laughs) Right? It's really not the amount of money. It's, It's where we have it in our lives. Now we say, it's a good thing that I'm not rich, right? Because... I love how quiet it is. People are like, I'm not laughing at anything. I'm not. It's a good thing that I'm not rich because when we say that, anybody, when we ask who's rich, they're like, that person is. Everybody else, well, who's rich? Anybody who has more money than me. That's how we normally answer it, right? We don't, if I asked you who, who's rich, you would say, you know, there'd be very few people who'd be like, over here, buddy, I'm rich. <laughs> We're always thinking somebody else is rich, that person that has more than us. And when you you point to somebody else, you think, oh, we're talking about the rich, rich people. But isn't it interesting that if we were to to kind of look at the definition of rich in our world today, if we were to even just talk about the pressures and anxieties that you and I feel financially sometimes, most of the world, I mean, probably an easy 80% of the world would look at us and not be able to understand the pressures, the anxieties, and the, the, uh, the scale on which you and I are defining rich, if that makes sense. In one sense, everybody in this room is rich because we live in such abundance in our country that, that I think other people many parts, in many parts of the world and in many other circumstances would be confused by our definition of rich. Now, let me help you understand what I mean by materialism. It has to do with an excessive desire for, uh, de- excessive desire for or dependence on money or material things. 
Jesus says in Luke, watch out for greed. Watch out for materialism because it's hard to see. Other sins can be way more obvious, right? Right? There's a few things that it's it's hard to get around uh, when you commit a sin. But greed is always somebody else's sin. Did you ever notice that? There's very few people. in uh, In so many years of pastoring, I can't think of... Maybe, maybe there have been a couple or a, maybe one person through all these years that ever came to me and said, I'm really struggling with greed, right? Because we always think that that's somebody else's sin. And this is a great indicator today, what I'm talking about, that when Jesus is saying, watch out for it, because it's the sin that can sneak up on us. Because in itself, it tends to blind us even to our own problem. Let me just give you a little, just a little bit of a, of, a, of a litmus test or maybe a diagnostic today to see if this is something that you're wrestling with, if you're in the right place that God has for you. These are just a couple of questions that I'm sure you're going to love me for asking you today uh, where, I want you to, uh, where I want you just to answer in your own heart. Number one, how do you react to rich people? Do you resent them? Do you feel superior to them in your humility? Do you envy them, right? If if you struggle when there's a rich person, let me just encourage you today. One of the the learning experiences in my life in in the... this, the time that I've spent in different cultures and, and even living overseas for brief periods of time, those have been incredibly instructive to me to be around believers who literally themselves, even though they had very little, were not envious or resentful of people who had more. It was such a great lesson for me that the real, the real indicator of whether we're living in freedom and in faith in this area of our lives is that we don't resent or react to riches in a way with envy or superiority or resentment. Number two, how do you react to poor people? Do you look down on them because they have less? Do you wish that they would go away? Do you perhaps, you know, you know kind of avoid them and, 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 and just avoid the, the topic altogether? If that's a thing for you, then let me just say there needs to be some adjustment in your life. The third question How generous are you? Now, these are just very broad questions, but I I really want you to to begin to just do a little bit of diagnostic today to say, you know what, Uh, how do I react to somebody who who has more than me? How do I react to somebody who has less than me? How generous of a person am I? Because to live out a Christian life, when Jesus says that you are going to be a person, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. I really believe that part of being a Christian is being generous enough that it impacts your living. Right? Is there, is there in a sense, a cross that I carry in the, in, the, uh, in the financial area of my life just as much as in other areas? Am I willing to have to be generous enough to impact me, to give in a sacrificial way? How generous are you? I think if you look at how, if you're careful to listen to what your money is talking to you about, it can give you a great understanding of this. Secondly, money talks, but secondly, money always listens. What I mean by that is that you and I simply are not owners. The Bible says that we are managers. We're stewards. When it comes to money and possessions, Jesus is really clear. We are stewards. And here's the ultimate indication of that. If you don't get to take it with you, you don't really own it. And as much as we like to think that we get to keep it and we hold on so so very tightly sometimes to our possessions and to our resources, the bottom line is they are ours for a season, folks, and then we let go of them whether we want to or not. We are stewards. We are managers of the resources that God entrusts to us. And as such, money always listens. It will only do what we tell it to do. Okay? I'm going to say it again. Money always listens. It will only do what we tell it to do. Money will always serve us in the way that we ask it to. What I mean is, there's nobody, there's no dollars making decisions for you (laughs) or for me. That money will only do what we tell it to do. And it can serve us Well, money can serve us well, but let me help you understand this. If you flip it, 
and we serve money, it can be a great servant, but it is a harsh master. Okay? Money will serve us well, but it is a harsh master. We can put it to work for us, but if we're serving money, ultimately it will run us ragged and leave us empty-handed and empty-hearted. Some of us in different seasons of our lives have cried to God and said, God, help me. I need wisdom. We're up against an impossible situation. God, I need healing. There's no answer for this apart from you. And let me tell you, those are faith-forming moments in our lives when we have nothing else to turn to, no one else to turn to but God. But let me tell you, money is different than that. What I'm talking about today is different. Those are situations that we can't control. But money matters. And Jesus spoke to money so much because this is an area that I can control because money will always listen to me. My money will always do what I tell it to do. Money always listens, and here's another key point. It works hardest for me when it works for something bigger than me. Don't try and ask money to do something for you that it can't do. It will listen to you, but there's a limit to what it can do for you. It cannot provide significance. Now, some of us are, it's, this, is, this is such a across-the-grain sort of talk today, and I'm, I'm really not pulling any punches with you. I probably never really do here, but, you know, I'm, I'm just giving it to you the way I, that, that I see it, is that it's easy for us to look, to ask money to provide some status for us. And you see it all throughout our culture, that people want riches, they want wealth, not just so that they can have, you know, dollars in the account, but because they want to feel significant. And the way you know that you're searching for this is do, when you see somebody who has less than, than you, do you consider yourself to be better than them? Do you consider yourself to be, to be more than them? I, I mean, I've, I've seen it over and over again because I've, I've rubbed shoulders in different settings with, with people who, have, who, are, who are, have great means and who are very wealthy. And sometimes you see a person who is so humble and they are, it seems to be that they are unaffected by their wealth. And then other times you see people who seem to think that because they have resources that they should be running everything. <laughs> And they look down on people who are less than them. Let me help you see. It doesn't really matter if you're uber wealthy or uber rich or whether you're just, you know, solidly middle class. We all have a tendency, if we're looking for significance from money, we, we have a tendency then to look, look upon those who have less as though they are less significant. Watch out for that. Don't ask money to give you significance. And then also, don't ask money to give you security. When I say this is an area that we can control, what I mean is that I can tell my money what to do. And many people want just, it's a knee-jerk reaction in a world that it has so little control. The older that we get, some of you guys will track with me on this, the, the longer that you are, you know, on this rock and making these turns around the sun, the more you realize life is very difficult to control. And Sometimes our knee-jerk reaction as we get older is to say, well, then I need to get as much money as I can to give me as much control as I can get. That would be a mistake. Now, there are degrees of, there's a degree of consistency that we should have in our finances that we can aim for to say, you know what, I want stability in my family. I want stability for my life. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have stability, but to look for ultimate security to look to money for ultimate security would be a mistake that too many people make and that too many people are disappointed by. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, can, later on in this passage, he says, he talks about the lilies of the field and how God clothes them so beautifully. He says, and some of you, you're just obsessed, obsessed with trying to get, you know, to look the finest and be the best. He says, can any one of you add a single moment to your life by running after these things? And the answer is simply No. We cannot control some of the fundamentals about our lives. And so it would be a mistake for us to ask either for significance or for security to come from money. That is something that we put our hope in God to get. So we say money talks. Money always listens to us. Whatever we tell it to do, it will do. And then thirdly and lastly, money is a means, not the meaning. Money is a means, not the meaning. My most faith-building moments in life, I will say this, some of the most 
exciting and kind of full-hearted moments in my life have been when I aimed for something bigger than me. I would say all of them actually were like that. All of those moments, and I've had a few wonderful moments where I, I could just tell you like throughout my life where I have committed something to the Lord and I feel like I was put to the test. Will I follow through on that commitment in terms of my giving and my generosity? And I can say without Without a single exception, God has remained faithful through that time. There have been moments where I can say that I can talk to you about, like, my earliest lesson in this was when I was first um, living overseas, and I was a missionary associate in El Salvador, and I had committed to give. I realized very early on, I, I, first of all, I was, like, 18 years old and 19 years old at the time. I was like, I don't need anything. I can buy bananas for next to nothing down here, and I can buy pasta, and that's all, you know, I, I just was like, I can, and then I'm out traveling around doing different things, and we're being hosted in different places, in homes, you know, in, in the countryside and different parts of the country. I was like, you know what? I don't need much. And so I committed to the Lord that I was going to give somewhere probably around the, I remember the dollar amount, but it was around about 70% of my budget to the ministry that I was serving. Now, what happened is, as time went on, and I, I was kind of, like, uh, accumulating that over time. I was really excited. I wanted to give, like, this one big gift. And as time went on, some of my supporters started to drop off. <laughs> and in particular, one of the most significant supporters, I think, forgot to send me <laughs> their support over the course of months. And I started to get, now, a little bit scared. <laughs> and I, I, I got to this point where I was uh, a little bit feeling lonely, a little bit of culture shock set in about seven months in, which is typical for that kind of time period. Uh, I was kind of feeling like very isolated. Now, it's hard for any of the younger folks in here to even conceive of this, but there was no email in that day. Not, I mean, I'm not just talking about no social media. I mean, literally, there was no email. They used to physically, I know this sounds like barbaric, but they used to physically have to take pieces of paper and fly them to the people that you were trying to communicate to, right? And so I would write letters. That was it. That was what I could do. Now, we, we did have phones that reached to the United States. And so we, I was able to call on a landline once a week to talk to my parents. But I, had, I really saw it as a thing where I wasn't, I was like, do I, do I freak out at this moment or do I just remain steady in this commitment? And let me just tell you what happened. In this moment, I had a moment where I remembered I was hosting a team from Colorado. It was a team of women, uh, a women's ministry that was there, and they were there to, to actually sew throughout the week because there was like a puppet ministry there, and they were sewing throughout the week. What a proto, you know, what a typical, like, you know, you know I don't know, never mind, women's ministry thing, you know, like, it, like, it was true. I'm not trying to be offensive here. That is a, so they, they were all there, but I, like, this is, they were all a group of, like, my mom right? It was like 20 moms in the room. And so I would drive them around in this van, and I remember dropping them off where they were going to work for the day, and I got back into traffic, which is in San Salvador. It was really bad. And I remember I was just stopped in traffic, and I remember putting my head against the steering wheel and beginning to cry, saying, God, I think I bit off more than I can chew. I was feeling so lonely. I was feeling defeated. I was like, God, I don't think I have what it takes to do this. I don't know what to do. I can only trust you. And I remember just saying, God, I'll just stay, because what, you know, I was like, what, I, I'm good. I'll just stay committed in this. The week, went on, the, the week went on, and then we, we, finished, we finished the week, and I was, uh, they, they were having a remaining session. I was just kind of sitting in the back because I was just there to host them. I was just, just kind of the person who would run them around and do stuff for them. And they, uh, they asked me at the end, they said, oh, Steve, would you come? And I, this is my mom voice. Would you come? We want to pray for you. And I said, oh, that would be great. You know, and so then they prayed for me, and it was really, a, really a, a moment for me. And then they said, you know what? We were together, and one of the ladies in our group really felt in their, in a, their heart that we should give you uh, an offering just for, your, just for being here. And let me tell you, I can't tell you, there have been at least three distinct moments in my life where this has happened. It's so cliche when everybody says this, but it was the exact dollar amount. <laughs> Of the shortfall. So without, I can't, I'm not, I know it's cliche, but I'm saying it anyway. It was like God saying to me, it's like God's little message, like, Steve, I see you. Be faithful, and I'll take care of you. Money is a meat. You know what that did for me? That was so much more valuable than having the dollars in my account to actually have that experience of seeing my faith built up and knowing that God was watching me and knowing what I was up against. That was a blessing. 
I've said over years in ministry, and in particular in youth ministry, our goal is to make memories. As parents, in parenting, our goal should be to make memories. And so this is the bottom line. Sometimes in our lives, it comes down to a decision or a choice between stuff and stories, right? Between the, the, re- the resources that we have and the experiences that we could have that build up our faith or that build relationship and that build connection and trust and intimacy either between us and God or between us and other people. And I know that many people, a lot of times, we, we're so drawn in our hearts. We're so drawn to the stuff. But I want to challenge you today that there is something better than this stuff. It's the stories that we get as we're faithful, as we walk by faith with the Lord, as we are generous to the people around us, as we love God and love others. When we are, are, are being generous like that, let me just tell you, nobody is celebrating stuff at funerals. Right? There's no need to to celebrate, oh, isn't it great how much they had there? They don't have it anymore. (laughs) What What we do when we're at funerals is we tell stories, right? What we do when we get together with friends is we tell stories because that's the most meaningful thing and the most binding thing that we have as human beings. Your right now resources have the power to become a story, right? That what God has placed in your hand today if you are faithful to the Lord with that, can actually translate into an experience and into a story for you, for somebody else, even maybe a story that you never get to hear until you get to heaven. I am excited because I really believe there's going to be moments when once, once this life is over and we are, we are together in heaven where people are going to stand up and say, you know what, we've, we've, back, we've traced all the dollars. <laughs> Actually, I could, I could tell you these stories from being in missions and being a part of missions for a lot of years. You go back and you see your dollars, your right now resources can make a forever impact in people's lives. So we can choose today whether we want to hold tightly to our stuff or whether, whether we want to honor the Lord with that and actually see it become a story that makes a forever impact. New City Church is only here because people invested, because you continue to be faithful. I already said that today. This is not, I, some of you have been uncomfortable as I've been talking, and I, 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 know, I know that. Some of you are like cheering me on inside. You're like, yeah, because you, you've experienced that freedom in your life. Let me just encourage you today. This is not an appeal for dollars. It's an appeal to you to be, to be free and generous with your, with your resources so that God can use you and bless you and give you the joy and satisfaction of being a person who, who is literally ter- translating stuff into forever stories. If you've been blessed with greater resources, you have a greater responsibility to invest in others and to invest in God's work. Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do it. Jesus literally says, don't treasure earthly treasures. That's what, that's what he's saying. Don't treasure earthly treasures, but treasure heavenly treasures. It's interesting when we say, when we use that as a verb, right? Don't treasure it. Because how do I treasure something? It becomes the thing. When I treasure something, it, it, it's the thing that I place, that I look to and say, if I have this thing, it, it's worth it. My life is worth it. If I have this thing, it'll all be worth it. I, you could take away all the other stuff, but I treasure this. That's, that's that thing. At the center of every soul, the Bible would tell us, is something that your soul has looked at and said, I treasure this. And if I can have it, then my life matters. My soul needs this. That is the thing that you serve, and that's what Jesus is talking about. He says, money can be that thing that you are serving. Once your soul treasures something, you'll pay any price for it. Now, you know this. If it's a spouse or if it's children or family members, you would say, anybody who's experienced a loss in their life would say, I would give up everything I have to have them back because I treasure them. I would lay it all aside. I, you know, zero out the accounts, take away everything that I've worked all my life for. I just want them back. 
because we treasure them. Once we treasure something, we'll pay any price for it. Here's the thing. The treasures, the things that, uh, the treasures of this world, they will demand you. They will demand your life in exchange for it. This is what Jesus is trying to help us see. All the treasures in our world, they, w- they will demand our life in exchange for it. But hear me out here. Jesus is the one treasure who gave his life in exchange for yours. That's the beauty of this. When we serve Jesus, when we treasure him, when we treasure that relationship in our lives, it, it doesn't empty us, it actually fills us up because he's the one treasure that isn't asking for our life in exchange. He actually already gave his life in exchange for you and for me. That's the gospel message. First Peter 2, that's what Peter says. He says, you are a chosen people, right? He says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You've been called by God out of darkness into his marvelous light. It actually says in there, his treasured possession. He gave his life in exchange for you. That's why we have the freedom to say, God, I trust you. You've demonstrated who you are to me. That's the gospel message. That you and I, undeserving as we are, more sinful than we dared believe, are also more loved by God than we dared hope. All of this talk of money, folks, it's really not about the dollars in your account. I don't mind. I don't, I don't care. I don't need to know. how some of, some of you front like you got like a, you know, bank accounts on bank accounts and, you know, you're, whatever, all that stuff, you know, and, and, and you really don't have much. And then some of you, the, the wealthiest people I've ever met, I would have never guessed. It's just the fact. That's the way it is. I've I've met a billionaire or two in my life, and I would have never thought. (laughs) Dad jeans and New Balance all all day long. (laughs) Right? This is the fact. It's really not about the dollars. What I'm talking about today and what God would address in our lives is where is our heart on this? Because a small amount or a big amount in the wrong place can be blinding to us. Let me just help you to see this today. If you're here today, the very first step in getting this right is to put is to make Jesus the treasure of your life. To acknowledge to him to say, "You know what? I really I believe and I thank you, Lord, that you gave your life in exchange for mine. That when I didn't deserve it, like the Bible says, when you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us." That's the first step today.